Hi, everybody. Welcome to this session at SWK Technologies in Power 2021, our virtual customer conference. Uh, today, we'll be talking about FDA compliance uh, and getting into a little bit of detail on a new and some proposed regulations that are out there uh, that we need to be aware of. My name is Steve Janak. I'm the Director of Solution Architecture for uh, Enterprise Practice, which includes Sage X3 here at SWK Technologies. Um, I've been in the technology space for about 10 years now. Prior to that, I've got 25 plus years in uh, manufacturing and operations, uh, working in, uh, in industry. So uh, I'm well versed in this, as well as uh, uh, many other topics of discussion related to manufacturing and, and the requirements of uh, FDA, et cetera. So, um, what we're going to do today is we're going to just talk really quickly about the current regulations related to recall that are out there. I'm going to talk about the new regulations that are out there related to uh, a chapter in FISMA, and then we're going to get into uh, proposed regulations that have come down the pike uh, since last November, um, are in the process of review at this point, um, and we'll discuss what that could mean to the industry going forward. So uh, with that, we'll talk about current regulations and the different recall types. You know, under FDA 21 CFR, we had two different chapters, 7.45 and 7.46, that highlighted uh, some recall types. Uh, primarily, there was an FDA requested one, which they just kind of said, you know, you might want to think about it. Um, and sometimes we comply, sometimes we don't. Uh, sometimes these are also considered voluntary recalls on the part of the manufacturer. Um, the secondary one is 7.46, which is a strong suggestion. That's really where the FDA is saying, hey, um, there's enough evidence building here that we think you ought to move on this now without waiting for it to get any worse, okay? Um, and then under the Food Safety Modernization Act, uh, Section 423, uh, they actually put in a, a provision for FDA mandatory recalls. Um, this is where they can act quickly and um, <clears throat> forcefully if they feel that the public health is at risk. So uh, if the, they feel that whatever's happening out there with a certain type of food could put the public in danger of serious illness and or death, they can institute this section and, and force you to do a recall. Um, so that's where we're at right now. Um, and uh, that's kind of held true for a while until recently when we started to have some other issues out there, uh, specifically with uh, leafy green vegetables, fresh foods, et cetera. Um, and they kind of came through and did the new version of FISMA chapter 204. Um, this is the one that is now going to be in place. Uh, this came about because of some of the issues we had with uh, uh, the leafy green vegetable outbreaks a couple of years ago where it was very difficult to trace back to what the source of the problem was. And every time they thought they had a handle on it, they discovered that they didn't. And more and more product was appearing out at the customer level. Um, so uh, there were actually hearings at that time. <clears throat> and whenever the government gets involved, uh, you know, things are gonna happen. So out of those hearings, uh, uh, congressional hearings, um, they came up with what were called the food traceability list. Um, this is going to be a list of high-risk products that uh, they want to have some extra traceability against and, and be able to track a little more detail than what we've done in the past. Um, it's right now in the implementation stage, as I indicated. Uh, and it is important to note, it doesn't replace any of the current regulations for recalls or the classes out there like class one, two, or three, which are basically related to that, you know, voluntary strong suggestion or mandatory recall. Um, at that point. So uh, this is just an enhancement to that that is specifically for a certain grouping of foods. But I will say that if this goes well, it will probably carry on to the uh, uh, next also. Uh, and it'll, it'll be put into place against many foods, not just the ones on this list. So what are the products right now? Well, it's the ones you'd imagine. All that fresh food, the leafy greens, et cetera, that we had some issues with before. Uh, they're all here. Um, and there's going to be some specific things that have to be tracked that didn't have to be tracked before. <clears throat> in addition to that, are ready-to-eat deli salads. Uh, that's basically, you know, where we're going to take some of these leafy things and put salads together and put them in a, a case somewhere for somebody to take home. Or maybe we're doing that in our factory. Uh, we're doing those prepared foods, those mixed salads, et cetera, that then appear in the grocery store. Uh, very short shelf life. Um, and uh, we're going to have to do some more tracing on that. Uh, soft cheeses are considered a hazard. Uh, shell eggs have always been a problem in the industry, as we know, based on uh, salmonella and some other things out there. Um, nut butter, uh, fin fish, uh, and then crustaceans, mollusks, and bivalves. So it's a, it's a pretty narrow list of things that are on here. 
Um, but the key here is that, that this could be expanded at any time and could also be pushed out to all of the uh, uh, food that we're currently tracing out in the marketplace, okay? So um, the secondary portion of this is the proposed regulation called the FDA New Era of Food Safety Blueprint. I don't know if you've all heard of this yet or not. Um, it came out last year. It went through a comment period through the end of February. Comment period was closed, it's now under review, at which point there'll probably be some revisions to it before they actually roll it out. Um, this is actually uh, required for those who manufacture, process, pack, or hold foods on the food traceability list. Um, basically, they want to establish and maintain records containing key data elements, as well as associated with different critical tracking events. So um, some of the things about that are uh, under the FDA New Era Food Safety Blueprint. Um, they have outlined some goals that they wanna achieve uh, in relation to a number of areas. But first and foremost is they wanna enhance traceability. We wanna have better records to find out where things are at and where they came from. Uh, secondary to that is to improve predictive analytics. Uh, they wanna take the data that they get in when there is a problem and analyze it so that they can see if there's any commonality or some indicators that say why it happened, wh where it happened, et cetera, and maybe start to predict where we might have future uh, problems uh, in the marketplace. Uh, they also wanna respond more rapidly to outbreaks. Um, this goes back to the problem we had two years ago where it took a, a very long time to figure out where the source of the uh, leaf lettuce, et cetera, was coming from that was causing the problem. Um, they wanna get to that level much faster. Uh, they also wanna address our new business models. Like I said, we're doing a lot of fresh prep now in little uh, backroom store areas, et cetera, or we might be doing them uh, in a factory setting, a plant setting where uh, we're just putting together uh, salads and then we're shipping them to stores, um, maybe fresh uh, uh, produce as well as, as um, other, other things and maybe packing uh, protein, which would be fish, et cetera, uh, for people to buy out of vending machines or different things like that. Uh, we see all those things in Whole Foods now. So um, they also wanna reduce the contamination of food if possible. Um, that's a big one that would hopefully come out of this. And they also want to foster a stronger food safety culture. Um, they don't want it just to be up to us as the uh, manufacturers. They want it to be also up to the wholesalers, to the retailers, all the way back down to the growers, that we all take responsibility for food safety. It's not somebody else's problem. It's all of our problems. So uh, another portion of this is they want to establish some tech-enabled traceability. Um, what that means is that uh, in order to go faster and down the chain and respond faster and know what's going on. The only way to do that is get the uh, uh, data in quickly, typically electronically, so that it can be analyzed quickly and they can make moves much faster. And the only way to do that is through tech. So technology is gonna be a big part of this going forward. What can your system do for you to do this faster? Uh, smarter tools and approaches, <clears throat> basically the same thing as tech-enabled traceability. Um, they want to do analytics to figure out how they can prevent outbreaks in the future, but also then to be able to do uh, responses much quicker and, and stop the spread of a, a potential problem faster. <clears throat> they want to look at these new business models and figure out how we, uh, what we need to trap, track and, and trace in those models so that we can make sure that, that we can find product quickly. And they also wanna capitalize on retail modernization. Um, the analytics that are coming out of the grocery stores now, et cetera, the big box retailers, uh, Whole Foods, Costco's, et cetera. Um, they wanna take a, a advantage of that and, and see if they can bring that into the chain so that they can get even better analytics as to what's happening, how long after a product gets there, is it sold, et cetera, et cetera, if there is a problem. Um, and again, going back to the food safety culture uh, thing, they want everybody to step hand in hand and make sure we all understand what we're doing, uh, why we're doing it, and work together to, to make, make everything better. So um, what is tech-enabled traceability? That's the first step. Uh, it really seeks to advance traceability to help protect consumers from contaminated products by doing rapid tracebacks. We want to be able to identify specific, specific sources of contamination very quickly um, and help to remove those products in the marketplace as fast as possible. Uh, ultimately, the goal is to support end-to-end -end traceability throughout the, the, throughout the whole safety system. Uh, the FDA is exploring ways to encourage firms to voluntarily adopt tracing technology, um, and that way, you know, we can kind of harmonize all our activities together um, and support us, ourselves across different tech uh, uh, solutions. But ultimately, you know, we have to work together to get this to work. So 
And the goal is to uh, eventually to implement an internal digital technology system by the FDA. So um, that's going to be similar to like blockchain, but but really it's going to be receiving these critical tracking events and key data elements from industry and regulatory uh, partners and, and reduce the reporting time of traceability. That's the big thing is that, you know, they don't want to have to wait 10 days or two weeks for you to get back to them with the results of your internal audit to find out where the product came from and, and where it went to. So. Uh, that's really what tech enabled traceability is all about. So, um, next under tech enabled tra traceability, we just talked about all this. Uh, but uh, they're, they're saying that you can still maintain all of your original paper records. Okay. You can still have electronic records like your Excel spreadsheets and things, or true copies, if, if you want to call it that, so that we photocopy and, and initial and, and do all that. They have to be legible and stored to prevent deterioration. They still might want to come in and look at them. Um, so that's fine. They have no problem if you want to continue to do things this way. However, the thing that you need to be aware of is that if there is a situation where uh, they are going to want to do a recall because they've determined that it is, is, has to be done, um, you have 24 hours to respond uh, with an electronic data file with your traceability records. So I don't know about you, but if I have everything stored in cardboard boxes and uh, paper records um, and I have a call like that, uh, I'm probably not going to be able to do that in 24 hours. Um, I'm probably not going to be able to do it if I just have Excel spreadsheets because I may have different Excel spreadsheets for different products and, and I may not have the best marriage of going from one to another for traceability within my system, much less being able to figure out where it came from, et cetera. So um, this is going to be a big part of it. And if your system can't easily spit out uh, everything you need to get to them within 24 hours, um, then, then you're going to have a problem down the line. So uh, be aware of that right now. This is a big provision. Um, this is where they're not saying that you have to change how you do things in your plant. However, you're going to have to change how you do things when reporting to them. So um, what are critical tracking events and key data elements? Uh, we'll jump into here right now. Uh, basically, the critical tracking events uh, are, are different steps within the process, okay? And each step, we're going to have different things that we need to supply. So if I'm a grower, um, I'm going to have KDEs that, that not only require me to lock control my product as I'm pulling it out of the fields, uh, but I also need to track my geo position of where I took it out. So if I've got a farm, a, a, a vegetable farm that's got a thousand acres, I have to be able to pinpoint where any particular lot came out of the field. Um, within a certain geographical fencing uh, location. That way, if there's a problem with a, with a, a product that's out there and they come all the way back down to me and determine it's me and they want to do soil testing, I have to be able to tell them where that came out of the field so they can do soil testing so they can find out if that's where it's coming from. That's a big one for the growers, okay? Uh, we have receivers, uh, two different receiving statuses. The first receiver uh, is, is the one who gets it from the grower and actually possesses it. Uh, possession is a big part of this. You, you not only have to buy it, but you have to store it in a facility that's owned by you. If you're just buying <clears throat> as a pass through to the next, then you're not the first receiver. Um, if you're a broker brokering these things, you're not a first receiver. Uh, you're not even a receiver at all, really. Um, but the first receiver has to have all the info from the grower, as well as track the lots that they're going to uh, assign as they go through the process. So if they're reassigning a lot number to it, um, they have to be able to reference the grower info, in, including their lot and potentially the geo position also. Um, and then depending on the product, uh, there's a lot of other data elements that are going to go into each of these. Um, those have not been 100% released yet. Nobody really knows exactly what they're going to be, um, but we anticipate it's going to be quite a lot of information if they really want to do some type of analytics. Um, second, the receiving status is other receivers. Um, basically, that's anybody after the first receiver. So once they get it and send it to somebody else, um, they only have to worry about capturing the, the first receiver, lot numbers, et cetera, whatever their key data elements are. And then they're going to have to uh, either track that through to the next person or assign their own lots, et cetera, depending on what they're doing with the product at that point. Um, the next is a transformer. Um, transforming simply means you're going to take a food that's on the traceability list and you're going to uh, do something to it to make it different, okay? Maybe you're taking bulk and, and bringing it down into uh, <clears throat> retail packaging. Maybe you're uh, uh, changing labeling uh, because I'm not going to take it and send it to Costco versus to Walmart, but it's the same product kind of a thing. 
Um, I have to capture all the KDEs from the receiver I got it from. Um, and then I also need to assign lots and know exactly uh, um, where it goes from there um, on out the door. So that's the next level. <clears throat> then we have what are called creators. Creators are probably the strangest one because this is somebody who's making a KDE, or is making a, a food that's on the FTL, but the ingredients to it are not on the FTL. <clears throat> so if I'm making a food that's on the FTL <clears throat> and I'm a creator, I don't have to worry about tracking the lots of the items that go into making the FTL, but I do need to uh, um, have all the specific information related to uh, the FTL at that point, the lots and any other information required by them as I sell it to the next person. Um, I need to, to keep all that traceability in my system um, and then provide that information to the next person in the line. Um, after that, you know, there's shipping and then when it gets down to uh, retail, um, they're going to have to track all these lots also and, and uh, um, be able to, to be part of this uh, chain of, of possession so that we, we can trace everything from end to end so technically, uh, if I report a problem with a box of salad in the grocery store with a lock code, the grocery store should be able to reference that lock code, say who was the transformer, who took that and put it into the packaging. The transformer should be able to say who they got it from if it was another receiver. Um, and then that other receiver should be able to say who the first receiver was. And the first receiver has to know who the grower is and all the information there. And then the grower has to know uh, the lot number and know exactly what field it came out of and where in the field. So <clears throat> it is similar to blockchain, um, but we're not relying on everybody to know everything up the chain. We're only relying on each person to have to manage their specific portion of it. So um, <clears throat> questions always come up about what other record requirements there are. Uh, basically, uh, you need a description of relevant reference records. In other words, whatever uh, documentation I'm, or data elements I'm providing and the key data elements, I have to have a description of what they are and why, um, and anything else that would help them to understand what's going on. I need to keep a list of FTL foods that I've shipped over the course of a year. So if I do things seasonally, I have to know what I shipped when, et cetera. <clears throat> I need a description of how, how I manage my traceability lock codes. How are they assigned? How are they created? Uh, do they have meaning behind them, et cetera. I also need to provide all other information as required. That's a big statement, okay? Basically what this is saying is that uh, for, for any traceability program that's out there, I need to provide all the information it, it needed to understand the data within my records, such as internal or external coding systems, classification schemes, glossaries, abbreviations, et cetera. This is going to help regulators understand the terminology, your methods and systems in use on your traceability operations. So it's basically like a, a standard operating procedure document for how you uh, assign and manage all your traceable uh, items. So, um, <clears throat> so that's another big piece to this. So uh, let's talk about the end of this where we're going to wrap up real quick. Um, where we've talked about FISMA chapter 204 and the new era of food safety blueprint. Uh, basically, these are geared towards voluntary recalls right now, um, but uh, in the future, they will probably be uh, strong suggested as well as mandatory, and this will probably go out further than the FTL list at some point, so be aware of that. Uh, what we're talking about here is the highlighting of areas in the food interest at highest risk. Uh, they found that uh, especially fresh produce, fish, et cetera, it's really difficult to find out where it came from. So this is in response to all those issues and will probably end up being rolled across all, as I said, um, especially any foods that are considered higher risk, but maybe not as high as these right now. They'll probably be the first to be incorporated into this. <clears throat> we have forward and backward traceability requirements. I have to look backwards to where it came from and what the lot codes are from the suppliers. I have to look forward and see who I sold it to and make sure I provide all the lot codes that I assign so that they can find the product too. We're going to have recall audit checks. This is in place already, but it also goes into this area. <clears throat> Basically, as we go through this process, we're going to have to send our, our initial data results of, of where the product's at out in the marketplace and who it went to within 24 hours. Um, and then after that, we're going to have recall audit checks to see where we're at on the recall process. Did we did we trace backwards? Um, did those people start to do their work, et cetera? These will probably be about every five to 10 days, and there may be multiple. It's not just a single check-in. And of course, as things uh, evolve, 
there may be additional uh, check-ins required uh, based on, on results of what they're finding as product is brought back in. So <clears throat> also electronic data submission. Um, this is where we're talking about this standardized electronic data file that everybody's gonna have to send to them. Um, that's to be determined exactly what format it's in, but it will be required and it will need to go in within 24 hours. And if you can't meet that particular uh, deadline, um, then there are gonna be penalties for non-compliance. Uh, they want to make sure that everybody takes this seriously so there will be penalties so um, that's kind of it in a nutshell <clears throat> thanks for joining me for the fda new and proposed regulations uh session here we're going to have a workshop at about uh, 12 25 today uh i'd be happy if you'd jump over there and join me i'll be there live and i can answer questions or uh if you have any comments you'd like to discuss uh, something in your operation i'd be happy to talk with you um and uh thanks a lot for joining us today. If you have time later on today at uh, three o'clock, we are going to do a recall process automation in X3. Uh, we're gonna demonstrate how we can take your X3 and uh, uh, automate a recall process to get that electronic data file out to set up some customer calls automatically so we can call people on a recall notice, et cetera. So we'll go through forward, backward traceability, uh, how to manage that process, how to get to that final list of customers that we need to supply to the FDA and then call those customers. So hope to see you then.